Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, the end of that chapter. Uh, We're finishing our study of the seven churches today. Today we'll be looking at the church in Laodicea, the lukewarm church. Uh Uh-oh, busted. Maybe. Uh, The church in Laodicea, a church about whom Jesus had nothing good to say. He didn't commend them in any way like he did the other churches, just some reproving and some discipline. And I believe there's much for us here because God loves us. So let's read the text. We'll start in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, and read to the end of the chapter, Jesus speaking. It says, And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spew you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire, that you may become rich, and white garments that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and I salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. Those whom I love... I reprove and discipline. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on the throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is God's holy and wonderful word. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would help us this morning by your Holy Spirit to see the value, the glory and the wonder and the surpassing riches of Christ for us. That you would help us with that, Lord. We realize that we are people who uh, often put too much stock in different things, as the text speaks of, and are half-hearted when we ought to be wholeheartedly committed to Jesus. But Lord, you know our frailties. You know how easily we're distracted and overwhelmed and excited about lesser things, and we ask that you would help us to see Jesus as the ultimate, as the most wonderful one, in him we would find all of our hope and all of our joy, all of our peace and all of our strength. Help us to love him, Lord, with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, for we are greatly loved. Help me to be faithful in teaching and preaching this text in a way that brings you glory and helps my dear brothers and sisters here, as well as myself. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, the church in Laodicea, If you were John on the island of Patmos, just off of the coast of Asia Minor, now modern-day Turkey, and you wrote a letter and you sent it to the coast, it would hit first Ephesus, the first church that we talked about from chapter 2. And then it would go in sort of a clockwise motion along the courier route as these churches are located. And that's exactly what we've seen. John was out here off the coast, And then the letter went to Ephesus from Jesus next to Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and now Laodicea, kind of completing the courier circuit. And Jesus was addressing all of these churches, and each church was an actual church at the time, a historic church. They were there. They were real people with real context and real problems and real situations that Jesus was speaking into. But they were also representative of us, and they were representative of all the church at all times. And so in speaking to them, Jesus is speaking to us. When he spoke to the church in Ephesus and said, you've left your first love. I am to be your greatest love. Don't just be busy. Be intimate with me. 
Give priority to your relationship with me. He was speaking to us. When he spoke to the church in Smyrna who felt the oppression and the pressure of a culture that was in opposition to Christ, he encouraged them to be willing to suffer for Christ and to not compromise in their suffering and in the difficulty. When he wrote to the church in Pergamum, he was speaking to us when he, had, when he said to be discerning in doctrine. Don't tolerate error, but hold forth the truth and cling to the truth and espouse the truth within the church. He was speaking to us. And he was speaking to us when he talked to the church in Thyatira, where there was all sorts of immorality going on. He told the church there, and he's telling us to practice righteousness in the face of evil as the people of Jesus Christ, that there ought to be holiness in the church. He was speaking to us when he spoke to Sardis, who was the church that was dead but didn't know it. And he was telling us to be careful of cold, dead religion and outward displays and just going through the motions. He was calling us to an inward reality of a relationship with Jesus Christ. And he was certainly speaking to us when he spoke to the church in Philadelphia about the doors of opportunity he had opened for them, that their lives were meant to count for the glory of Jesus Christ, that they had evangelistic opportunities. And so we, our lives are meant to count for Christ's glory. And he has given us opportunities and open doors. He was speaking to us in all these things. And dear brothers and sisters, he is speaking to us this morning as he speaks to the church in Laodicea. And he speaks to them about their need for wholehearted commitment. They were the half-hearted church. They were the lukewarm church. And he's calling them to wholeheartedness. And this sort of route that the courier would have taken that forms sort of a geographical circle, forms sort of a holistic picture of what the church is meant to be fervent in its love for Jesus Christ, willing to suffer for Christ, discerning in doctrine in the face of a culture of error, holiness and righteousness being pursued and practiced in the face of evil, an inward reality, not merely outward displays and religion, walking through the doors of evangelistic opportunity, letting our lives count for his glory and giving ourselves in wholehearted fervor to Christ. This can be a challenge for us, as it was a challenge for the church in Laodicea. And it was challenging for a few reasons. Laodicea was an extremely wealthy community. They were extreme, extremely, excuse me, affluent. Um, in AD 60, they were destroyed by an earthquake, as other surrounding cities were. And the other surrounding cities, when they were destroyed by an earthquake, including Philadelphia that we talked about last week, they appealed to the Roman government for some financial aid to rebuild. And Rome was happy to oblige as long as they would consider building a new temple to Caesar or changing their name after naming themselves after the Roman Empire. Rome was all too happy to help them rebuild, but not Laodicea. When it came to Laodicea, they refused the help of the government. They said, we've got enough resources and money of our own. We are a self-sufficient people. And they rebuilt themselves in even greater glory and splendor. And they were proud of it for they had the resources to make it happen. Laodicea City was a Laodicea City. Laodicea was a city of big banks and big money. And they had a certain resource there that was wanted by the rest of the world. They raised beautiful black sheep. And it was said that the, the wool on these sheep glistened and, and shimmered and it was black as midnight and it was beautiful. And from that, uh, from that wool, they would make carpets and tunics and different clothing. And it was a big resource for them that they exported, but they also, also sought to clothe themselves in the splendor of it. They not only had big banks, they had beautiful black garments like the world had never seen. And they were also sought after for their medical community. 
They had a school of medicine there that was world-renowned, where people were being trained, and they were pushing forward advances in medicine and, and research. They had developed an eye salve that was famous all around the then-known world. People with different eye ailments would come to Laodicea seeking some of this eye salve. They had the best doctors and the best training and the best treatments, and they were on the cutting edge. They were where people came when they wanted to get better. They had resource, they had something to offer, they had beautiful black clothing and big banks, and they were proud of all of it. And Jesus uses this as an opportunity to speak into their lives and into the life of the church. And so he says in verse 15, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. But you don't know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. They thought they were rich and they didn't need anything and they didn't need anybody's help. After all, they had all the medicine, all the wool, all the money, but they lacked one thing that every city needs. They didn't have water. Laodicea didn't have a good water source. Their water source was contaminated with minerals that made the water bitter and it would turn your stomach. And when you drank it, you would spew it out. And this is difficult for any city with bad water. Carpinteria knows about this. And they were looking for something better and they had neighbors who had better water. One of their neighbors was the city of Aeropolis and Aeropolis was famous for its hot springs. And the hot springs had medicinal value and, and they were life-giving and they were vibrant and you could relax in them and they were useful and you could use that hot water, a great commodity in an ancient culture for all sorts of different things. They didn't have nice water like Aeropolis. And then one of their other neighbors, Colossi, had beautiful, deep, cold water springs, fresh, cold, living, vibrant water bubbled up from the ground in Colossae. And say, man, we've got big money and beautiful black clothes and we know how to help people who are sick, but we haven't got decent water. And so what they did was they built aqueducts, right? They said, we, we want some of that water. So they built an aqueduct coming from Aeropolis to pipe in the hot water and they built an aqueduct coming from Colossae to pipe in the cold water. And they said, yes, we'll bring it in and now we have everything. And much to their chagrin, when the hot water got there and the cold water got there, it was all lukewarm. Didn't travel well. Didn't last long. Didn't stay hot and so maintain the value that hot water has as being useful. Didn't stay cold and so maintain the value that cold water has as being refreshing and rejuvenating. Jesus takes hold of this opportunity and says to them, you guys are like your water. You're lukewarm. And they all knew what that meant. No one likes lukewarm liquids. Think about lukewarm milk. Disgusting. Give it to me icy cold or hot with some cocoa in it or something, but don't lukewarm milk, blah. And so Jesus lays hold of this imagery. And he says, I wish you were hot or I wish you were cold. Now we have to misinterpret that. And we think that hot means on fire for Jesus and cold means just dead to Jesus and in opposition and not caring. That's not what he's saying. Both have value. It doesn't mean cold and loveless or lifeless. He means cold and vibrant, bubbling springs of refreshing water is what the Christian's life ought to be like. And hot in rejuvenating, useful, restorative, relaxing water. So the life of the Christian ought to be vibrant like hot water, refreshing like cold water. And he says they were, they were neither. There wasn't the vibrancy in their Christian lives that they so sought after in their water sources. They had become lukewarm. They had settled. They weren't traveling well. They weren't lasting long. They'd become tepid. And Jesus says, because you're neither hot nor cold but lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. That doesn't sound good. 
What is he saying? I'll spew you out of my mouth. Remember, he's speaking to his church whom he loves. Let me tell you what he's not saying. He's not saying, gosh, you're not on fire, and you're not like a bubbling brook of fresh cold water, so I'm done with you. I'm throwing you away. I'm spitting you out. You're out of my kingdom. That's what he's not saying. It's not the gospel of the kingdom. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what he's speaking about. He's simply using imagery that everyone could relate to. Everyone got it. When you're looking for a cold drink of water on a hot day and it's lukewarm, it's just not what it's meant to be. And when you're looking for hot water to use for something and it's lukewarm, it's always a disappointment like your coffee mid-morning. And Jesus says, this is a disappointment. This is not the way it's meant to be. You guys have gone in a direction. You guys have settled into something you as my beloved people ought not to be, lukewarm. You're not fresh and vibrant and blub- bubbling over with my life and you're not on fire with the reality of my love for you. You're lukewarm. Complacent. Passive in your Christianity. Idle in your heart, and your expressions of Christianity. Shallow, not deep like cool water. Self-satisfied is what they were, and so they were superficially settled in their lukewarmness. They were wealthy, for sure, material things, and they were self-sufficient. They were well-dressed. They were successful fashionistas and physicians. But Jesus said to them in verse 17, you say I'm rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, but you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire that you may become rich and white garments that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and I salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. Jesus is using some more provocative language here. He's really wanting to get their attention, isn't he? Remember, this is for us. He's really wanting to get our attention. And he says something to them that's so like in your face. So you guys think you don't need anything in your affluence, in your comfort, in the ease of life, but you don't get it. You're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. He's saying this to people whom he loves, whom he gave his life for. It's strong words, but he's wanting to get their attention. You see, lukewarmness brings with it a certain degree of not knowingness a certain degree of spiritual blindness where we just settle and we're not aware of things that we ought to be aware of. And you say, you guys, you guys think it's happening because on the outside, it, it seems to be and there's some, some physical blessings there, but you're really missing it. They were, they were blind. They were unaware of their true condition before God. For them, it was perhaps their affluency, their self-sufficiency, their sense of fashion, their medical advancement. These things that are all meant to be blessings had become for them a distraction. And that happens to us, doesn't it? God intends to bless us with good things. God has good things for us. They're just not meant to be ultimate things. They're not meant to be things in which we find our identity, our joy, our peace, our, self, our sense of self-worth, so on and so forth. And looking to those things for it, we miss it. The wealth of their culture, Jesus wanted them to know, could not meet their deepest needs. Man, we we need to hear this. Because by all standards, certainly by world standards, we are wealthy people. We are affluent people. We are blessed people. But we need to know as Christians, and we need to say to the world as a church, that the wealth of our culture can never meet our deepest needs. For them, their needs were deeper than their resources could handle. They couldn't be addressed by big banks, beautiful black clothes, fashionistas or physicians. They just couldn't. They were deeper than their resources could handle. They weren't physical or economic. Their needs were spiritual. 
and for them, as I just said, this is where we need to pay close attention, their abundant physical and economic resources had dulled their intense need for Jesus. You know, don't you, Christian, that the need for Jesus never goes away. We need Jesus as much today as the day that we were saved, born again. We need Jesus, his love, his strength, his grace, his mercy, his sustenance every single day. We need Jesus. And what can happen sometimes is that the other things in our life anesthetize or begin to dull that sense. God spoke to the nation of Israel about this through Moses in the book of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, Mo was telling Israel, look, you're going into the promised land. And there's going to be blessings there. It's going to be a land that flows with milk and honey. There's going to be resources and there's going to be opportunity like you've never known. And there's going to be all of this gain. But in all of your getting and all the opportunities and all of the resources and all of the drinking of the milk and eating of the honey, don't forget the Lord God. Because... The good life, the easy life, can just sometimes cause that to happen. You know how it happens. When everything's going along fine, sometimes we drift. The heart just gets crowded with so many other things. But then something happens, a little wind in the water, some waves to batter the ship of our lives, and we're like, Jesus, calling out to him. That's okay. But we, we need to be careful of some of our physical comforts. Let's say, take us away from the main thing, which is Jesus. So he says to them, you got big banks, beautiful black clothes, you're a bunch of fashionistas and physicians, but you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You have everything and yet nothing. Consider yourselves rich, but there's an inward poverty that's taking place. Isn't it interesting to you that we are the wealthiest nation in the world and yet seem to be the most depressed nation in the world. We've got more psychologists and psychotherapists than anywhere else on earth. If, if, if money and gain and, and resource and affluence are what makes us happy, why are we so unhappy because we all know that there's something that money can't buy. We all know that there's a wealth that is not attained in the physical realm. We know that we have needs that our resources cannot speak to, that can only be met in Christ. And continually so, as our lives with Christ continue on. More is not what we need. Jesus is what we need. And Jesus is calling them to recognize their deep need. And in so doing that, when they recognize, gosh, I've been anesthetized, I've been sort of lulled into lukewarmness by the culture around me and, and all of this stuff that I'm giving myself to, when they recognize their deep need for true connectivity to Jesus, that will begin to save them from lukewarmness, which is not the way it's meant to be. Complacency, passivity, superficially settled, shallow, and idle. So Jesus says to them in verse 18, I advise you to buy from me. I advise you to buy from me. They were engaged in all sorts of commerce. And he says, now I want you to come to me. I advise you, he's giving them advice, to buy from me. Buy, he's not speaking of, okay, you can buy your standing before God or you could buy heavenly riches or you can buy salvation. That's not what the Bible teaches. He's just using commerce type language that they were used to. He's saying, you're used to being the sellers and the providers. You're distributing medical resources. You need now to come to me, the great physician, the great shepherd of the sheep. From me is the operative phrase. I advise you, I give you this advice. Come to me for these resources that you cannot meet in and of yourself. He says that they ought to get to him, from him, excuse me, gold refined by fire. 
gold refined by fire, that they may become rich. But they were already rich. They were the ones with big banks. But no, they needed to be made rich toward God in intimacy and relationship with Jesus Christ. They were laying up riches on earth. They were rebuilding Laodicea better than before, but they weren't laying up riches in heaven. Buy from me gold refined by fire, figurative language that speaks to this idea that only Jesus can enrich us with abundant life. Only Jesus. He says, come to me. You want something that's real and deep and rich? Come to me, the great shepherd of your souls. He says, buy from me white garments. White garments in the Bible always speak of of the covering of sin, the, the removal of sin. God said through the book of Isaiah, though your sins be as scarlet, I will wash them white as snow. When we see the church together with Jesus in Revelation 19, they're clothed in white robes, which are the righteous acts of the saints. It speaks of righteousness of God's people, imputed, given as a standing before God through faith and repentance in Christ, and practiced as followers of Jesus Christ. He says, buy from me white garments, meaning only he could ever cover our sin and our shame. We try to cover it in so many ways. We try to cover it with makeup. We try to cover it with outward appearance and the latest gadgets and the best car. We try to cover it with good deeds and showing up and getting it done and all these different things. Acting like I'm okay, you're okay, we're okay, right? We're okay. Jesus says, the only place to go with that sin and shame is to me. Come to me with your sin and your shame. And then he says, buy from me eye salve. I already told you they were famous the world over for their eye salve and helping people see. But Jesus is saying that he is the only one who can truly open our eyes. And brothers and sisters, in so many ways, we need our eyes opened. Sin always has a blinding effect. Settling into lukewarmness always begins to dim perception. And Christ has given us new life and vibrant life that bubbles up like cold, refreshing springs and is hot and fiery. And this is to bring clarity to the way that we see God and the way that we see ourselves and the way that we see the world around us and culture and truth and error and righteousness and all these things. We need clarity because we live in a culture that's always wanting to muddy the waters. Let's just keep it lukewarm and muddy. Jesus says, come and let me deal with your eyes. Let me open your senses, your perception. Let me help you to see clearly that you might follow me faithfully. And this is the advice that Jesus is giving to the church in Laodicea, that they need to come to him as their ultimate source and resource and be less self-sufficient and more Christ-reliant. Get that? Leaning more heavily on Christ. He says, I advise you. I advise you to become rich through knowing me in your relationship with me, inward riches. To be clothed in my righteousness. Not trying to cover up your sin and your shame elsewhere to come to me for clarity. I'm the light of the world. Let me shed light on your life, your relationships, your loves. Who I am. This is his advice. He says, I advise you. Jesus is giving us advice. Now, brothers and sisters, we know there's a lot of other entities offering us advice. Culture's got advice, but it's not go to Jesus for gold refined by fire and white garments and eye salve. But there is advice being offered to us by culture and the world all day long, and it would have us look elsewhere for these things. It would fill our heart with other things and with lesser things. And our own flesh, our own flesh is always advising us, trying to convince us of the fact of, yes, 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 you can have Jesus, but if you also have these other things and make these of greatest importance, then you'll be happy. Jesus is part of the equation, but you need some other stuff. Our flesh advises us that way often. And let's not forget the old enemy of our souls, that serpent of old, Satan. He's not advising us to go find all of our joy and riches and glory in Christ. 
He's not telling us to forsake our sin and our shame and take them to Christ, that through his forgiveness we might be clothed. He's not saying that our eyes need to be open. He's saying, just let it settle. Just settle down a bit. Don't be so hot. Don't be so cold. Just go with the flow. And in the flow is found tepid, lukewarm sort of Christianity. Jesus speaks into all these other voices and said, says, here's how I advise you. And we ought to listen to the advice of Jesus. In verse 14, he introduces himself as the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of all creation. You know what amen means? It comes from that Hebrew word that means truth, certainty. That's firm. That's fixed. That's unflinching, right? When someone says something good, you're like, Amen. That is true and certain and fixed and good. Jesus says, I am the amen. And I'm the faithful and true witness. He tells the truth. He is the truth. He leads us in truth. He witnesses of the truth. And then he says, I'm the beginning of all creation, which does not mean he's created. Let's remember theology here. Jesus is not created, though he draped himself in humanity at a point in history. He always existed. He's a pre-existent one, the second member of the Trinity. Jesus has always been. The word there, beginning in the Greek, means the source of all creation. The scriptures tell us that Jesus spoke all things into existence. That nothing exists apart from him. That all things came into being by him and through him and all things exist for him. So if he created all things, he knows all things. He knows where our riches are false and lesser than. He knows where we're trying to cover up our sin and our shame in ineffective, non-efficacious ways. He knows where we need to have our eyes open. He gives us good counsel. Come to him. And he is the one who loves us. Verse 19, he says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Jesus is saying some hard things to the church in Laodicea today. Jesus is saying some hard things to us as a church today. But whom the Lord loves, he reproves, rebukes, and disciplines, leads in a different way, pushes in a different way as a great shepherd of our souls. Whom the Lord loves, he tells us the truth. And you know who loves you most because they're willing to tell you the truth. When you recently at that holiday dinner had a giant piece of cilantro on your front tooth (laughs) and everybody knew it but you nobody was saying anything because they were too concerned about the embarrassment of it but someone there I hope loved you enough to lean over and say the one who can tell you when you smell is the one that loves you the most (laughs) people who love you tell you the truth Jesus is telling us the truth in his infinite, unfathomable love, whom the Lord loves. He reproves and he disciplines. So if there's any sense of reproof and discipline today, it's the Lord loving you. It's the Lord loving you, loving me, loving us, and calling us out of complacency Idleness, shallowness, self-satisfaction, and superficial settling. And we, we have to get that. Because if we miss the motive of God's love for what he's saying to us, then we miss everything and we'll never respond rightly. It'll just be another religious show. It'll just be another thing I gotta do. But if we know that it's an expression of God's love for us, then our heart begins to respond rightly to the call to being wholehearted toward Christ. And what we find expressed behind the text and what we find in our daily lives is that we have to remind ourselves continually of the truth of the gospel. Don't we? 
Don't we have to remind ourselves continually of the truth of the gospel? The gospel is not only the means by which we are saved, it is the means by which the Christian lives. We have to remind ourselves continually of the good news. That's what gospel means. It means good news in the Greek. But the good news comes, as it often does, on the heel of bad news. And the bad news is that we are more horrific than we ever dared to think. But the good news is that we are more loved than we could ever possibly imagine. Now, why do we remind ourselves of this? We remind ourselves of this because it always brings us back to Jesus. Because when I discover again tomorrow that I've acted badly and I'm somehow in my flesh bad, where, where do I go with that? Where can I go but Jesus? And when I find tomorrow that I've once again been rejected and I don't feel loved and I'm fearful of my standing before men and maybe even before God, where can I go but to Jesus? And what does this do to the heart of the woman, the heart of the man, but cause it to rejoice? Christ has died for my sins. I've been accepted before God the Father because of what he did for me. And I experience and am in his love as a beloved child of his. We got to continually remind ourselves of these truths. Our ongoing need for Christ. Because if we are not reminded of our constant ongoing need for the gospel, if we do not feel that Jesus is our greatest need, then other needs will begin to seem more urgent, more immediate, more significant and relevant. Let me just say it plainly. That was a rather robust sentence. If we don't get the fact, feel the fact, lay hold of the fact that Jesus is our greatest need and the source and the center of all of our joy, then other things begin to seem more important more immediate, more urgent, more relevant. And we begin to give ourselves to other things. And the human heart gets crowded. And so the call on the Christian is to carefully and consciously oppose the growing significance of these felt needs. To constantly be pushing ourselves and one another back toward Jesus when we think, well, I, yeah, yeah, Jesus, but I need this. Back toward Jesus. To deal with these felt needs, which are really false needs, which begin to crowd out the relevance and the reality and the joy of God and the gospel and the kingdom. And we find ourselves through these subtle creeping distractions like slow water moving through an aqueduct just settling into a tepid lukewarm shallow sort of existence because fire needs to be stoked fire needs to be fed you can't leave fire alone lest it begin to grow cold and to go out. Fire has got to be stoked and fed. And cold has got to be kept and preserved. How much more in that ancient culture before refrigeration? Cold is like a serious thing to keep it cold, man. Fire has to be stoked and fed or it grows lukewarm. And cold needs to be kept and preserved or it grows lukewarm. That is why the scriptures say in Proverbs 4 that we are to watch over our hearts with all diligence for from them flow the springs of life. The Christian life is not one of passivity. It's not a lackadaisical thing. It's not one of complacency. It's meant to be a fiery vibrancy and life-giving, bubbling, cold, refreshing waters that need to be fed and kept through our relationship with Jesus. Fed and kept through our relationship with Jesus. 
You know how we view our lives? We'll use this circle to kind of represent it. My life. That represents my life. And what we often have is this. J for Jesus. Jesus as a part of my life. I have my life, and there's a whole lot in my life, and certainly Jesus is a part of my life. And isn't that how you live life? You've got your life, and Jesus is a part of life. And we might even talk about this as our heart. There's our heart, and I let Jesus in my heart, and he's got a part of my heart. But there's all these other things. That's often how we view Christianity. But I think the Bible speaks to a different thing. Let the circle now represent Christ, Christ's life. And the hope of the gospel is that we might be found, me, in Christ. Colossians 3 says, your life is hidden in Christ. Christ is your life. You see the difference here? Do you see the juxtaposition? One is sort of half-hearted and one is whole-hearted. And it involves our heart, but we've also been brought into the heart and the life of Christ. And that's supposed to be the consuming fire and the springs of living water of our life. But what we do is we bring Jesus in and he starts to get crowded out by all these other Good things, good stuff. I I love good stuff. I've got more surfboards than anyone here, guarantee it. (laughs) I love good stuff. I've got more hobbies and fun things and all kinds of junk. I love stuff. But they start to crowd my heart. But you know what else is in our heart? There's also lots of hurts in our heart. Right? And those take up space too. And those begin to crowd it too. But the hope of the gospel is that we can fully surrender our hearts and our lives to Jesus Christ so that we are found in him, our life hidden in Christ. This is complacency. This is lukewarm. This is the crowded, half-hearted Christian. This is life in Christ as it's meant to be. And the only way, the only way to move from here to here. The only way to move from here to here is through cultivating intimacy with Jesus Christ. That's why he says this in verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. You see, the invitation is one of intimacy. He uses the Greek word there for the dinner in that culture. It wasn't the quick breakfast. It wasn't the -the on-the-run lunch. It was the relaxed after all the work is done, gathered around the table, communing with one another. Jesus says, I'm at the door of your heart. Why is he at the door? We use this often in evangelism. Jesus is at your heart's door knocking, but he's talking to the church. I'm at the door of your heart. There's a sense that it's so crowded that there's Christ knocking. He says, I'm I'm, I'm knocking because I'm I'm calling you to intimacy. I'll come in and I'll dine with you and you with me. The idea is long, lingering fellowship. Long, lingering fellowship is what we're called to with Christ because he loves us. How do we get there? He tells us in verse 19, repent and be zealous. He says to repent and be zealous. He uses two different tenses in those Greek verbs. Repent is in the aorist tense in the Greek. That means past tense. He's saying, I want you to do this once and for all. I want you to repent of half-heartedness. I want you to repent of complacency. I want you to repent of shallowness. I'm calling you to something deeper, better, truer riches. They're only found in me, but you need to repent. 
You know what repent means? It means to say, I'm wrong, God, you're right. But it's not just something we say, it's something we do. It's a change of life direction, beginning to discover the riches of God in Christ. He says, repent and be zealous. Be zealous is not in the past tense, it's in the present tense, which means a continuous action in the Greek. He says, I am calling you to repent once and for all of complacency and be continually zealous. How do we do it? Because we can't just muster it up on our own. Then we fall into performance again. Then we fall into pretending again. And then we fall into religious displays. Once we've repented, how do we maintain zealousness? It's only when we hear Christ knocking at the door and we open fully and we begin to dine with Christ regularly, fulfilling his ancient desire of meeting with his people in a lingering way. Spending time with Jesus at the feet of Jesus and intimacy. Martha, Martha, you're worried and bothered, distracted about so many things. Mary's chosen the good part, the only part that really matters. She was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word. Jesus, I think, is saying in the text to the church in Laodicea, you guys have a lot of good stuff. You guys have a lot of good stuff. But somewhere along the line, your stuff became the main thing. And I love you. And I just want you to remember that I'm the main thing. I'm the only one that heals. I'm the only one that restores. I'm the one who renews your soul with cold, refreshing water and fires your cold, hard heart with white, hot passion. I'm the one who loves you. So be with me. That's the only way to move from here to there. Repent and be zealous, cultivating lingering intimacy. So I finish with this question. In what ways do you linger with Jesus? It's got to be intentional, doesn't it? It's got to be intentional. There are serendipitous moments, moments where that lingering just happens and you find Christ in this place and you're enjoying his presence, and he's ministering to you. But, but doesn't being a disciple of Jesus Christ call forth some discipline from us? Where do you intentionally linger with Christ? What will 2015 look like for you? Don't be a victim of your schedule. Be the master of it. Schedule Jesus. He's like a mama here saying, hey, bro, dinner's at... My mom said, bro, hey, bro, <laughs> dinner's at five. Be there. We're going to be together. Work is done, and we're lingering together. Jesus is calling us out. So, so are you hearing the call? Come away with me, my beloved. Are you in your life intentionally lingering with Jesus? I find that it means I got to, like, schedule it. That's not perfunctory. That doesn't make it routine or mundane. I am just so distracted by so many things, mostly good things, some very hard things, that if I'm not disciplined in my endeavors to draw near to Jesus through the reading of the Bible, the study of Scripture, prayer, worship, and meditation, then I won't do it, and I will go lukewarm pretty quickly. It doesn't take that long for hot to cool cold to warm up. So what will your year look like? How will you be intentional with Jesus Christ? He makes us the most incredible promise in verse 21. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. Invite Jesus to the table. It's just the table of your life. He ultimately invites us to the throne, to the place of being secure in his kingship ruling and reigning with him. You don't have anything better than Jesus. Let your heart be filled with Christ. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for speaking to me. And hopefully thank you for speaking to us.
again, Lord, I, I just confess that I'm distracted by many good things and some hard things, but you're bigger and you're better than them all. And so we ask now as we endeavor to linger, now, Lord, as we're going to, during the second set of worship, linger in your presence, we ask the Holy Spirit, you would help us to draw near to Christ. Help us to see Jesus as bigger than the storms in our lives. Help us to see Jesus as more wonderful than the blessings in our lives, for which we are thankful. Help us not to let other things be the ultimate thing. And help us, Holy Spirit, to experience Christ, to experience intimacy with him, to hear his voice, feel his embrace, to know he holds us and that he's with us. Help us, Holy Spirit, to know the love of the Father, to enjoy it, to be rejuvenated, restored by his love. Help us with these things, Holy Spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.